And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. Jeff Fawcett and I come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. In the 1960s, before becoming film directors, Mike Nichols and Elaine May did comedy. In one of their skits, a man gets a call from his mother. When he answers, she says, Sheldon, this is your mother, remember me? She goes on to tell him that he's a very successful man who is too busy to call his mother. And he goes, yeah, he's saying, yeah, yeah, mom, I know, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, yes, mom. So she says, I had to go to the doctor. Oh, oh, okay, so what did the doctor do? He x-rayed my nerves. No, no, um, okay, and what did he say? He said, Mrs. Goldberg? You're a very nervous person. And she says, yes, it, well, you know, I have this very successful son. He's fabulously successful. He's do, too busy to call his mother. Well, this is funny unless it's familiar. Today, I want to talk about the nervous system because it can really mess you up the most, especially these days. Over the years that I consulted with people before retiring... I often thought that if people could only learn to relax, they might never get chronically ill. This hour, I'll be, I'll be attempting to make the nervous system more scrutable and offer some choices to you so that you might protect the delicate balance that all of your systems require to keep you running like a finely tuned watch. Today, your nervous system. One of three major communication systems that that talk to each other along with the nervous system there is the endocrine system this is where all your hormones come from sex hormones and stress hormones and your lymphatic system which is your immune function all of these are carrying systems they talk to each other so for example In your midbrain, the hypothalamus, which is part of your emotional brain, talks to your endocrine system, again, the hormones, especially under stress. Your lymphatic system releases cytokines or killer cells when you're fighting an illness. This tells your nervous system that you're sick, which will make you feel really bad, bad enough, hopefully, so that you rest. It's pretty neat. The nervous system has two major modes. There's a sympathetic version, which is the fight or flight, and your parasympathetic, which is the part that relaxes you so that you can rest and sleep and recover, which is very important balance. It's terribly important. And it's disrupted by multiple environmental influences, including your social emotional stressors, like the mother with the successful son who can't win. And all the various things in your internal and external environment. So that would include your air, but also your food and your drink and things that you breathe. Disturbances will disrupt natural balancing mechanisms. So you've heard me go through this again. Your stress, uh, your, your response to stress goes in peaks and valleys. So you respond to a stressor, you get a gush of adrenaline... And then cortisol moves in, and cortisol is a natural inflammatory, and it's, it also gets you gets blood moving to the large muscles, so you can get away, you can run away, or fight if you have to. Chronic stress, where there isn't sufficient recovery, where you're not running away, you're stuck in a car or a meeting, and you don't have time to recover from it, you don't sleep, etc., gets, it gets you to a place where your cortisol levels stay high, And with high cortisol levels that don't come down, 
you start having metabolic disruptions. You start gaining fat. Fat, sorry. <laughs> fat. Well, it's fat too, I guess. You start gaining fat around your trunk. You get a, your belly gets big. Um, your, bl- your blood sugars go up. And uh, it also makes it very hard to sleep and rest and recover. And it's a round robin. If you, if you get stuck in a valley, that's getting stuck in a peak. If you get stuck in a valley, the cortisol levels are chronically low. People call this adrenal burnout, which is not really an accurate way to describe it. But what happens then is you don't have your natural anti-inflammatory uh, mechanisms working. So allergies get worse. You're cold all the time. You're tired. Your blood pressure and your, your pulse are low. And you have very low resistance to pathogens. So either one of these, getting stuck in either of these places can be caused by people being under stress of all kinds without recovery. And chronic stress can also be an unresolved illness. So, you know, who knows what made you end up with a chronic unresolved illness, but now you've got it and that adds to this chronic stress picture. And they can, it can come from things like now we've got Lyme disease rampant all over the place now. We've got dental infections. I mean, it goes on and on. Um, and they can cause, that kind of infection can also cause heart problems. So it's a real mess. A simple example of a kind of abrupt sort of thing happens that sort of sends you in another direction is a car accident which not only causes some physical injuries but unexpected emotional ones. And then you add to this some medical interventions that can further load the stress side of your native homeostasis. Our culture tends to overlook, as additional stressors, anxiety and, um, you know, overwork and eating the wrong foods, eating foods that don't serve you, drinking too much, smoking, all of that stuff. Most people are not encouraged to take the time to integrate a traumatic event. They try, you know, people try to shake off the effect and get on with it. They get up and they say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. It turns out, people who have looked at all of this, that it's actually better to just sit down for a second and allow yourself to to shake. The shaking is a way for your body to integrate what's going on and to release some of the stress. It turns out to be a really good thing to do, and and most of us obviously don't want to feel vulnerable at a time like this, so we try to hide that we're affected, but it's better to just sit there and shake and breathe for a while. This is what animals do. Once they escape, they do this, and they recover much more fully from these hits. As you know, human beings are famous for being relentless and have the unique ability to stress out over a simple thought usually delivered by our beleaguered amygdala at around 4 a.m. in the morning. The wheel turns and the effects accumulate, contributing to the development of a covert, hidden, or overt, obvious, chronic ill health picture and a hyper-aroused, sorry, hyper-aroused or sympathetic dominant nervous system. Most, most people who listen to this show know that toxic pollutants in all parts of our environment, including food, air, water, Vaccines, drugs, viruses, radiation, chemicals, metals are carried into children through the womb. So pregnant women are exposed to all of these things and the children developing who are very vulnerable are affected. And it's believed that they have contributed, these exposures have contributed to a dramatic rise in childhood brain injuries. And those can, they, those can present like learning disabilities, mood disorders possibly autism, epilepsy, immune compromise and suppression, as well as disordered and imbalanced sex hormones. So thyroid disease, diabetes, and pernicious puberty, early puberty. These are effects where the environment is pulling the trigger on an already loaded predisposition, and this is called epigenetics. And now we know that these effects are carried into the third generation so that the maladaptation appears in the grandchildren of those exposed and then these exposures and their effects become inherited characteristics. That is, if an environment in all its different manifestations is not corrected, a toxic environment. So correcting for indoor air quality, carpets, paint, cleaning products, lead, fragranced products, dust, radiation from all electronics, 
wireless routers, smart meters, antennas on the ceiling or you know nearby or on the on the roof, not ceiling, but the roof of your building, uh, light bulbs, low low energy light bulbs are unfortunately releasing a lot of fields. Um, so it, it, these these are environmental. This is environmental damage that occurs without the knowledge of the exposed. What happens here now is it leads to a loss of tolerance. We've talked about this before. What what it means is it takes it takes much less to topple us. One really bad exposure like that, and and all the margins start to shrink. People at this point can't just walk off the toll of these stressors. The nervous system, the hormone system, the cardiovascular systems do what they can to adjust these, these, uh, to these exposures, and they may end up causing some dramatic symptoms. So loss of tolerance, toxicant-induced loss of tolerance. So you, could, you end up having th- early th- you know, things that you don't quite figure on having, you don't know where this is coming from, but you start getting heart symptoms, palpitations, arrhythmias, high blood pressure. And in some cases, heart attack. But the path to recovery is generally not to suppress the symptoms with aggressive treatments. These can cause additional stress. The body, it turns out, does things for a reason. It's unfortunate that people aren't taught to acknowledge stressors and exposures sooner. And that goes double for protecting children. Now, one example of the body does things for a reason is recently... Jeff did a show, Jeffrey did a show with uh, Stephanie Sendiff, who talks about the importance of sufficient sulfation in the body, which is unfortunately uh, um, sometimes disrupted and, and impossible for the body to do properly after exposure to glyphosate pesticides like Roundup. It, it affects it. But one of the things that she discovered that's really remarkable, it's one of these examples of body does something for a reason, is what ha- the, the importance of a substance that can happen, it's something in the, it's a type of cholesterol. It's called, it's cholesterol sulfate. So it's a, it's a sulfur containing version of cholesterol that's protective to the heart, it turns out. And indeed, when the heart's under stress, or even during a heart attack, cholesterol sulfate goes up and it's not understood as a protector Ways to increase it, ways to increase the the cholesterol sul- sulfate in a non in a non invasive way is to get some sun exposure, just enough to have a light tan, because it's made in your skin. And this is it turns out it looks from the literature as though this is protective. So the body will cause disruptive heart symptoms sometimes in an attempt to produce cholesterol sulfate in an attempt to protect itself and how much better it is to reduce your exposures and get out in the sun a little bit. Now, as I said, the the real double whammy is children who are developing. So the the earlier these assaults are dealt with, and the, the less likely their effects will accumulate, leading to an entrenched physical and psychological intolerances and symptoms. To some extent, as you may know, this is where I'm going, exposures are avoidable. So I'll remind you that this discussion is focusing on the nervous system because disturbances that affect the nervous system undermine all the other critical systems who have a handshake with each other. So as I mentioned before, you have a lot of stress, it's going to affect your hormone production. In fact, if your cortisol is really high, your thyroid hormone doesn't work well. And indeed, if it's low, your thyroid hormone doesn't work well. And your sex hormones get interrupted so that you don't have the protective effects of your uh, testosterone, progesterone, estrogens, various sex hormones. So these things are all handshaking. They're all trying to protect you. Addressing the nervous system along with supporting rather than suppressing other systems, allows healing through restorative sleep, reordered metabolic function and capacity, and improved gut function. 
so that nutrients are absorbed and utilized to rebuild, restore, and gen generally all of the systems. So back to the idea that after a hit of any sort, your body needs to recover, and it can't if the exposures are chronic. Chronic exposures, chronic environmental exposures, chronic emotional exposures. So let's, let's, uh, let's think about what things are avoidable. I might uh, at this point just remind you that you're listening to your own health and fitness. And I'm Lena Berman, and I'm lecturing alone today on your nervous system. Okay, avoidable exposures. In the last 20 years, industry and the telecoms and the military have increased, have increased human exposure to radiation that in, a, in a way that's not designed or delivered to us in ways that are native to us and to life on this planet. We are electric creatures. We are exposed to electromagnetic radiation, but the type of fields, the, um, how can I explain this? The, 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 the quality of the way that they're designed and delivered, they may, they're pulsed. Uh, the fields are not the same as the ones that we grew up around and there are layers and layers and layers and layers of them and we're finding a dramatic increase in the number of people who are becoming intolerant because of this because we keep adding more and more and more and more so to remind you these are not voluntary exposures for most people because it's just everywhere microwave radiation digital revolution. It's failed in all critical and current research to be safe. No matter what the industry findings are showing you, if you look at independently funded research, you will find that it is not considered safe at any level. That the low levels cause in some cases even more mischief and certainly layers and layers. So, it's, it's very interesting that the director of the National Toxicology Program federally funded $25 million, 16-year-long study, stopped it early after just, gosh, I don't know, a year or something, stopped to do a press conference because what they found, this is now again, this is the largest study ever performed on the health effects and, of the whole, and it's a whole body exposure. Um, and it is such an expensive study, it's not likely to be repeated. It's the one that everyone has been waiting for. Now, when we talk about cell phone radiation and whole body exposure, remember that th this is what they're studying here now, but this is only one of many devices and, and rampantly developed infrastructure that's, that's proliferating around us that exposes us. I mean, we've got smart meters and it goes on and on. It's just layers and layers and layers. What, the, what they found in this study, this huge study, after only a year, which just really confounded them, they were really shocked, was they found cancers of the brain and the heart, very rare cancers of the brain and heart, that developed very fast and this is very conclusive. And they never imagined that this was going to happen. They were so impressed as I said, they released early results in a press release in order to affect public health standards. I mean, they felt something should be done about allowable limits, especially for children. Well, as you may know, we were just about the only people who actually talked about the study and covered what exactly they found. The rest of the media basically ignored, ignored this piece of news and... You know, people said things like, just don't put, it, put, don't put your phone against your head, which people continue to do. Um, this is a travesty, I have to say, that this, but it's going to, you know, the study is ongoing and it will result in more alar alarming results since there's usually a longer latency period for cancer to develop. So that makes their early results all the more frightening. Documented effects on humans and even more vulnerable children with developing brains and body mass are, along with the cancers, and, the, and now we're seeing a lot of early autoimmune diseases, very rare autoimmune diseases in younger and younger adults uh, and children. But some of the symptoms, again, are hyperarousal, so you're wired. Even though you're using wireless, you're kind of wired, and it's kind of fun. 
but then you can't sleep and then you're anxious and maybe start to develop some depression. There's dizziness. There's tingling in the body. F- quality of heating on the skin, the skin, rosacea and skin effects. Uh, tinnitus, you know, ringing in the ears. And certainly lots of different heart symptoms like like um, fibrillation and, and uh, palpitations and high blood pressure. People have gastrointestinal symptoms uh, lots of uh, trouble with their digestion isn't working right and I mentioned the skin stuff including an increase in melanomas, skin cancers also blurred vision and decreased fertility for men and breast cancers in young women now you may have noticed that several of these symptoms like the heart symptoms are related to the nervous system And in fact, exposure to devices, smart meters, towers, antennas, and all their infrastructure cause a sharp rise in heat shock proteins, which are an early marker of a strong stress response in the body. And to that, one of the places we see it is the mast cells in your skin, which are an immune system marker, become granulated and inflamed, which indicates that the immune system is reacting to a very powerful stressor. So let me say this. While you're worrying about Fukushima drift, another thing that no one's talking about, but people do talk to me about it and and ask me what to do, uh, possibly affecting your children, being thoughtful about where fish is being harvested, because people who sell fish are now stressing this is not from Pacific waters, this is from Alaska, or it's from the Atlantic, where fish, fish, you know, where your fish is being harvested for your dinner. Where is it coming from? You're thinking about that. You think about Think about how you can cut back on the radiation that you can avoid, which might help. Just just reduce what you can control. We lived without these devices all this time. And work and connection all happened fluidly. Think about exactly what you're being sold and whether the next generation and the heating planet will be able to recover from this major environmental pollutant. Pay attention to what uh, pay attention to what soothes and calms your beleaguered nervous system and what overloads it, so that you sleep well, digest well, recover well, and can make healthful decisions about yourself and everyone around you. So, I'm using the wireless revolution as an example of an exposure that you have some control over. Obviously, if you wake up one day and the apartment building you're in is suddenly got ten microwave antennas on the roof and you start to notice that you've lost all your tolerance as one testimony in the book uh, a um, a electronic silent spring by Katie Singer her testimonials from people who suddenly became sensitive had this experience of never always using the devices enjoying them using all of them having a great time and then suddenly she can't tolerate any of it and she can't work and she can't sleep so, this is, you know, it's, I realize that, you know, people used to say when we started talking about this, like almost 20 years ago, which is about when it's been increasing, um, it's a done deal. I, you know, I can't work without my smartphone. I can't do this. I can't do that. And first of all, remember that <laughs> in the beginning, cell phones were just phones. And when they were just phones, that was better because the amount of data going back and forth on a device will, is, is going to, is going to, um, it's going to be consistent with how much how much exposure to fields you're getting. So the fields increase when more data is going back and forth. So you make a phone, a computer, like a smartphone is, and as much fun as it is to go on the internet with it, you are increasing your exposure to the fields by an inordinate amount. In fact, I remember in the early days when we didn't have smartphones, when we only had uh, Blackberries and Trios. Now, I'm dating myself, but, you know, people, anybody who is... Uh, over 40, or even some people over 30, remember that we didn't always have cell phones, and the first phones were just phones. And that was pretty thrilling to be able to have a phone and call somebody, and those phones were safer. And they were analog instead of digital, too, in the beginning. So the the less data that's going back and forth, it, that's true of anything that you use. You know, if you're using an, an iPad 
again, that's a computer. It's a wireless computer, and you're using something which is producing enormous fields. So in the early days with trios and blackberries, I remember Cindy Sage, actually, there was no way to measure at that point the uh, electromagnetic field. So she just, well, sorry, that's, that's inconsistent. Um, electromagnetic fields that were radio frequency couldn't be measured at that point, but <clears throat> she measured how much just straight electric fields it was producing. Keep in mind that you're not really supposed to have a constant exposure to any electric field, just regular electric fields or on your refrigerator and your, and your, you know, your, uh, your radio and receiver and all the, your electronic equipment. You're never supposed to be exposed to more than about one and a half milligauss or maybe two at the most during the day. That's just not, you know, maybe a blast here and there, but never consistent. When, they, when, when she measured the trios and the blackberries, when they were downloading and uploading emails, they measured 9,000 milligauss. So that smartphone is not just producing general, you know, uh, radio frequency, which is huge, huge amounts. And all this SAR stuff of, you know, it, it has a lower SAR rating is based on a, <clears throat> a synthetic head that's supposed to mimic a man's head. So it's not, it's bigger than a woman's head or a child's head or any of this stuff. And so it's pretty useless. So looking for a phone with a low SAR is not very helpful. <clears throat> the most helpful thing to do is to use the simplest devices you can. <clears throat> Excuse me. To unplug at night, to take your devices and put them in, turn them off, put them in, you know, airport mode. They never go completely off. They're still looking for a signal. But get some shielded bags or even use aluminum foil and uh, keep them in that. Keep them out of your bedroom. <clears throat> unplug your wireless router from the wall at night or better yet you can buy wired routers there are some available but maybe you're only using one computer in a household and in that case all you need is a wired modem and you can find them but you have to ask very pointed questions to people you know you have to and don't be don't be shy about saying that it, you know it gives me a headache or it I have trouble sleeping or any of that kind of stuff. Remember that it's we're up to about one one point two. This was a few years ago. One point two million Californians, just California, Californians are sensitive now. Are electrosensitive, electromagnetically sensitive, are very sensitive to the stuff and can't basically use it and are basically uh, disabled this way. So wire up where you can, keep things away from your body, drop off is good. If you have things with uh, AC adapters, those boxes, if you plug them into a power strip or something, keep it away from your body. <clears throat> use halogen light bulbs, don't use LEDs. They were great when they started, now they're extremely high in radio frequency and, and the uh, compact fluorescents are really a nightmare. Um, but just use less. And, and do less of this stuff because it's prudent. It's prudent avoidance of obvious controllable exposures. And there are others, you know, there's things in your food, in your water, in your air, in your built environment. So, you know, prudence would say avoid chemicals like pesticides and insecticides. Don't spray ants with pesticides. I mean, insecticides. They, they probably don't care about the pesticides. Insecticides because it, it goes into the wood in your house. Even some of these orange oil products uh, are still somewhat toxic. So be very thoughtful about how you do that. There are borates, <clears throat> which are not toxic to us, which can be used this way. Um, don't use fragrance products. Filter your water when possible. And if you need to, filter your indoor air, too. Because uh, there, there's just all sorts of things in, in indoor air from new carpets on and on and, you know, furniture things and... Um, flame retardants and it's a big deal take stock of how you might be able to mediate indeed forgive me because i'm making you more worried your worries about the things that seem beyond your control and you can do this by connecting in your immediate physical environment with others who are also concerned take control over what you can <clears throat> whether it's disaster repairedness with your neighbors or sharing food that you can grow with what others are growing think to the future 
and turn dark into light by finding small ways to cooperate before extreme weather or <clears throat> food and fuel shortages occur. You can organize a cooperative within your area. It can just start with a few people at first, and when others find out what you're doing, it will grow because there's a need. We're going to need to take a brief musical break. I'm Lena Berman. This is your own health and fitness. I'm speaking to you alone about your nervous system. Um, this is your own health and fitness, as always. So please stay with us. We're going to take a, f a few moments to listen to some music. And when I come back, I will continue talking about your nervous system and how to protect yourself from all the stressors around you. Stay tuned. Welcome back. This is your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. I'm doing a show, a lecture to you alone today called Your Nervous System. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature, a free stream of this week's show, and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. If you want to reach us, please do that by email admin at your own health and fitness dot org so I've been talking about stressors that uh, put a big hit on the nervous system and then the nervous system additionally is so responsible for communicating with other systems that it becomes a hit for all your other systems you know your lymphatic systems cardiovascular system your uh, endocrine system all of these other systems are trying to help you adapt and when it gets too stressy they can't. So it might be worth mentioning, I've been talking about connecting with other people because um, one of the worst forms of stress is helplessness, feeling helpless. And boy, we've got more than enough of that going around right now. So getting, connecting and, and, get, and getting involved, uh, it, it, despite the fact that sometimes it isn't an obvious thing that you feel like doing and you may not want to do it all the time, you may want breaks. But um, it's terribly important, but it but it does pay to mention here some other forms of stress that people may not associate with stress. And one of my other favorite stressors to uh, to attack is uh, pharmacology, <laughs> pharmaceuticals in particular. But any kind of any kind of of psychotropic. Anything that you use that's psycho psychotropic or is is likely to have a downside, and people, of course, handle them differently. And I'm not talking about using herbs because herbs are far more gentle, and you can use far less with herbs to get an effect. And in fact, if you are prone to using very strong psychotropic, and you you all know what these are um, substances that may be herbs or may be actual drugs, that they may decrease your sensitivity, you know, because it's kind of you're pulling on your dopamine receptors and it, your system may just want more and more and stronger and stronger and herbs and flower essences and things like homeopathy work better if you're not using uh, other strong medicines and chemicals. Certainly, pharmacology is a, a slippery slope. Now, Oh, geez, we just, uh, you know, it's, you. Wa I watch, you know, I get contacted by people who are in the middle of some kind of, this, it, now at our age, as we get older, some kind of critical diagnosis, and they're making a choice about whether to dive in and do invasive treatments, which involve lots of pharmaceuticals, 
or, you know, they're making these choices. And some people choose not to. They choose to go a more natural route. Some people choose to dive in. And generally speaking, what I see is that I don't see good outcomes with um, psychotro- you know, psychotropic antidepressants and antipsychotics. I really don't see a good outcome with those, even though they may suppress symptoms very aggressively. And if somebody is psychotic, people say, oh, well, it saved his life but or her life. But um, I think not. Um, and I think there is evidence that these symptoms can be handled in another way. It just requires an enormous amount of work. And it may be also that it takes a lot of time to find the right thing. But generally speaking, pharmaceuticals of all kinds are kind of, as Jeffrey used to say, coming in like firemen and removing the smoke and leaving the fire burning. So it's worth thinking about. Uh, it, another obvious thing is addictive substances. And boy, there are a lot of those, aren't there? I mean, you, you might just find yourself sitting on the internet following links for hours and hours and hours and hours and people talk about resenting that that's an addictive substance uh the the producers of these devices <laughs> these various i these and i that's knew know from their own research that it has a, an addictive effect people actually get very upset when you take their phones away from them and stuff but any addictive substance is a form of and including the internet, is a form of self-medication. And when times are tough, you're going to look for... Uh, uh, some people are just going to look for a jar of peanut butter or, or, or a half gallon of... or a pint, if they're prudent, of haagen Well, haagen is isn't is an organic... some organic, wonderful organic ice cream or something. But this is a form of self-medication, and there may be a time and a place where that's useful, but there are, again, other strategies like putting on some just phenomenal, some music that just evokes phenomenal feelings in you and just dancing around the house or turning off all the lights and sitting with a friend and using like a little book light so that you're like sitting at a campfire or even better going and having not necessarily campfire in this kind of fire danger weather we're having, but, um, you know, sitting in the dark where you can where you can kind of soothe yourself and, and reading to each other. Um, there is a lot of ways to do this. Movement is phenomenal. But anyway, any of the any addictive substance, any form of self medication in small doses, I am not a prude. I have been known to eat half a jar of peanut butter if I'm in bad shape. And it's medicinal, I'm aware. But just know what you're doing and and understand that addiction is is a, a kind of, of uh, well, some people are more prone than others to addiction. Some people are more addictive. So if you know what your limits are, sometimes it's better to just say no, no. <laughs> um, but if you know you can do things that are not. So uh, 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 drinking is phenomenally um, expensive to the body. And for women, it it's a for men and women. It's almost a direct route to breast cancer in both in both in both genders, and it's just such a big bill, such a big bill. So know what your limits are with uh, self medication, and see if you can find ways to exercise and meditate and do things, dance. You know, all those nice exercises, great actually for getting getting a different view of the world, even if it's just walking. Now, something that people don't think about, I, I actually do think about it because it seems less and less possible to escape it. Even if, you, <laughs> even if you retreat to some far corner of the universe, it will find you, and that's noise pollution. Noise pollution is extremely, um, it revs up the nervous system phenomenally. It's a terrible assault on the nervous system. And for instance, in the studies, we, we actually did did a show with a researcher about noise pollution many years ago. Even if it doesn't wake you up in the middle of the night, but it's, but it's there. Jets, cars, whatever it is. Even if it doesn't wake you up, your body hears it, and the effects of the stress centers of your body can contribute to heart disease. It's that bad. And then another thing on this list is the news. Uh, you know, I, I find myself increasingly 
listening to the news and saying, this is news? Where's the news? I don't hear news. I hear the same stories, the same three or four stories over and over and over pounding away at us. And, and all news medias are guilty of this. It's catastrophic. I remember, um, oh God, uh, Tracy Ullman, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> when she had a show, she did an imitation of a newscaster and she would get on the air and she'd say, horror, death, murder, disease, famine, horror, and murder. <laughs> that was her newscast. So... I don't know what to tell you. Uh, everybody has different... I, I find that I want to know what the headlines say, although these days uh, I'm going to be time-dating the show by saying it. These days it's the Trump channel, uh, which is just feeding him. He's like some kind of mellifluent dark force that's feeding off of all of this. Sometimes I just listen, and I'm not saying you should do what I do, but I just I'll listen to the headlines... And then I'll see if there's going to be a story that has something constructive. Like, look at how great these people are going out and they're helping people in trouble and they're doing these great things that make me feel a little better about the world. And then I turn it off and I put on some music that I like. So that, that brings me to another thought, which is um, sometimes you do have to retreat. Sometimes you have to retreat in order to recover. And this is particularly difficult for people who have become chronically ill is to not be angry at yourself and struggle with yourself because you are in a situation where you need to recover. You, it's, never, it's never good to blame yourself for being disabled or sick. It just doesn't work. The best thing you can do is to think about what you do have, to try to concentrate on what things are still working, what function you still have, and work on getting better, which means to rest and recover and feed yourself and do various things that help you personally. But in general, with people who are dealing with being stressed out by the world and the environment and all those other things that I mentioned, staying engaged helps because, as I said before, it, it prevents a form of uh, learned helplessness, which is <clears throat> corrosive to the to the to everything, to your stress, your endocrine system, and all the rest of it, and your heart, and everything. I, I, Jeff and I often get these emails. We do a show, and then we get an email. We think, oh, I wonder if people like that show, or I wonder if it worked for them. I wonder if they learned something from the show. And we get an email, and someone says, <clears throat> who can I call to come out and measure the fields in my house? Or how can I protect myself from this, this, and this? Or um, who's doing what in terms of this or that? So my advice, inevitably, is think about what you want to see happening and start organizing it yourself. Start a group yourself. It can start with two people, three people, whatever it is. And it can be whatever it is that you feel called to do because it's all needed, whether it's help for the sick, whether it's uh, or, the, or people who are old or poor, right under your nose. Does somebody need you to give them a call when you're going in? to shop or something and see if they need you to pick something up for them. Uh, does somebody need a call? Just a call to let you let them know that you're thinking of them and an ear to listen to them. Um, is there somebody that you can... Sometimes instead of sending money, certainly we're finding out the dark underbelly of all of these relief organizations <laughs> which are relieving us of our money and them of their f bad feelings uh, are not helping, but you can directly go to somebody and, and if you have some extra money that you can afford to give that you haven't already given to your public radio station <laughs> or us, um, not us directly, but you know uh, the station that we originate on, um, it, you may be able to directly help somebody. It doesn't take much to help somebody. You can just, we had a, somebody who is dealing with a, a chronic Lyme situation and she's <clears throat> she's on disability and she's, you know, it's a mess and she couldn't afford to buy, to start trying the herbs that work for Lyme. So we said, oh, well, we've got some of these, so we'll put them in bottles and we'll send you a care package. Anything like that. And it will help you too. It will help you amazingly. But also organize yourself. If you, you know, 
if somebody is looking around, remember, you know, somebody say, well, you know, there's all this fruit in our neighborhood. It's all on the ground. It's all getting rotted. How do we, you know, and you call the the uh, food um, banks and they say, oh, you can't, we don't have anybody to pick it up. And So you become the person who goes around the neighborhood and finds out if, if, if people want to donate their fruit and if they can't, they don't have the time to pick it, then you find some people to help you and you pick it and then you take it over to the food bank. <laughs> you organize it yourself. All of All of us are brilliant at something. We're all brilliant at something. We're witnessing right now truly a collapse of the so-called our so-called civilization i think anyway so i'm asking you to put your energies toward what needs to be done with common sense and knowledge of what's needed in your own environment but you know it's like if you're walking down the street and there's an injured animal i think most of us will stop and try to give aid maybe not everyone but most of us so how about injured people what can we do that's you know that expands us it extends us in some ways in a way that helps become part of the solution i guess is what i'm saying and again we each have a piece of the puzzle everybody has a piece of the puzzle you listen to this show then you listen to some other show and it looks like we're not saying the same thing it doesn't matter all of it is a piece of the puzzle everybody has unique skills so to care for your nerves means figuring out what your unique skill is um, somebody very smart said recently that when you're under terrible stress, the best thing to do is to figure out what you love doing and devote yourself to it so that you're less distractible by the things that are torturing you. Obviously, I don't mean people in abusive marriages or things like that. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the the neener, 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 the thousand little cuts that take us down. Uh, and so many of them around right now. Oh, uh, you're listening to your own health and fitness. And I'm Lena Berman, lecturing alone. And Jeff Fawcett is sitting here looking intently at me and smiling, which is a good sign. Um, I'm talking about your nervous system. Care for your nerves. Use common sense dealing with your fears and stress. Direct it. Soothe it. Go on walks outside, unless it's horrible outside for some reason. Or just, you know what? Movement of any kind. Um, any kind of music that you love, you put it on. Any kind of movement you feel like doing slow, fat, you know, even very gentle movement with, you know, conscious breathing and stuff. When you can't sleep, unplug all your devices. Get them out of the bedroom don't have electricity plugged in don't have an electric clock next to your bed don't have a radio next to your bed move all of that away from your bed and put devices away out of your bed and put them in uh, shielded bags or aluminum foil and turn them off again unplug your router if you have a wireless router now there are some herbal tinctures that are gentle um, obviously people are Really, I think the one thing I really learned when I was consulting with people in the past <laughs> is how individual people are, how unique, how everything works for somebody. Any style of diet and various things, it's all incredibly individual. The only thing I always hope is that people are really paying attention to how they're doing when they change their diets and think about how to uh, balance their diets out, whether they choose and you know plant-based or whatever. You know, to me, it's like... I, I I say what I need to say to feel like people are educated. And then after that, it's like, you know, if that's working for you, I'm thrilled with that. Because I think there are lots of different ways to consciously take care of yourself. So the same thing with herbs and nervines. They're incredibly individual. And part of it is assessing your terrain. Uh, because herbs can be heating and cooling and all. It's true with food, too. You know, you want to find out, are you someone who needs... Uh, heat and stimulation because you're kind of collapsed and cold or are you somebody who's already pretty stimulated and sympathetic dominant what you need is calming and cooling and that can be true in herbs and food and all sorts of things so some of the some of the uh, nervines uh, I have found one that I like but again I'm me but catnip tea <laughs> your cat will love you actually my cat doesn't care but catnip tea 
um, you just need like a quarter of a teaspoon for six ounces of boiling water. And then I would advise not to drink the whole cup unless you really just need to be knocked out. <laughs> you know, you're just, you know, you need to just conk out. I find that if you sip a little bit of it, like an ounce or so of it, uh, at night when you want to sleep or if you wake up during the night, you have a little more of it. Um, um, it also, if you have a sip of it or two sips, if you're going into a stressful situation, again, not going to work for everybody, but it's a good one. Or, you know, you can also look at herbal tinctures. You really don't need much. I wouldn't take more than five drops to start out with. And sometimes one drop can have an effect depending on what you're trying to do. Um, there are also homeopathic doses of these things uh, that can be found sometimes. But, you know, one to five if you're in an intractable case, maybe half a dropper full, but, you know, often not even, but always start with less. So some of these are Skullcap, which is, uh, one thing that's nice about Skullcap is that it doesn't put you out. Like some, some things are very strong, like Passionflower, for instance, which is very good, but is likely to actually put you to sleep if you take enough of it. So for just taking, just t getting you to relax a little bit and, and still be conscious. And also it's a, this one is something you can use with animals too, Skullcap. But small amount, passion flower, very good, very strong, uh, sedative kind of quality. Um, another thing that's remarkably helpful that, that people don't think about is bathing in Epsom salts. It actually helps ground and, and, and rebalance the body when it's been exposed to fields. Uh, it also is good for getting magnesium in when people have trouble taking enough magnesium. They get gassy or something. They take a lot, but they need it. It's um, it's 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 very very helpful. It's also good for aches and pains. Now I would be remiss. Oh, and uh, you know it's obvious that watching out for overstimulating foods and drink, especially before bed. That's uh, I think people know that, but you know, but again, there are people who can drink a cup of coffee and go to sleep. I don't know those people, but there are people like that. So I would be remiss if I didn't attempt to talk about dietary strategies. And, and again, I, I, almost thought, I almost thought that it might be interesting at this point in my career to do a show that says, I take it back. Now, I don't really take it back, but I've discovered that not everybody needs the same diet. It doesn't matter which, what, what your proclivities is or your emotional proclivities in terms of people's health, in terms of rebalancing them and supporting uh, the amount of stress they're under, the amount of physical um, exercise and movement, and, and you know how much what they need, it's it's so individual. So the things to really pay attention to is, you know, discrete food allergies, as I've also said, because that will either put you to sleep or throw you into a state of anxiety and depression. It's it's so. It's, it was always the first thing that I, I did with people who had kind of, what is going on with me? I don't know what's going on with me. I would put them on a, a sort of paleo-style diet. We used to call that the cave person diet, where you have less foods that were grown with the advent of, of agriculture uh, because you're reducing some of the foods that are highly allergic, like grains and corn and dairy and things like that. But again... Not everybody's the same. So you, but you kind of rule out food allergies. Do you feel sleepy after meals? Do you feel high, depressed after meals? Your eyes feel itchy and all that. What's your gastrointestinal function like? Again, are you someone who needs cooling and calming? You probably know who you are. Or do you need heating and stimulating? So do I need to say this? I mean, obviously, a person who needs cooling and calming, cooling foods, apples, cucumbers, um, Mixing foods that are cooling and heating, like if you want to have some animal protein, you may have it with some vegetables that are cooling. You'd start to learn about these. There are books on uh, Chinese medicine books have, have descriptions of this kind of thing. Heating is stimulating. Those people can go for it and have spicy foods, but the other people, cooling, calming, as, the, as my acupuncturist used to say, no spicy. So heating, heating is stimulating people who can sleep on an airplane in the car anywhere. Those might need to, you know, garlic and... You know. Um, the other thing is, is paying attention to your tolerance for sulfur-containing foods. So uh, a lot of proteins are sulfur-containing. Um, 
all those cruciferous vegetables that are good for you, uh, onions and garlic, which are supposed to be wonderful for you. But if you're someone who got sprayed with glyphosate because your neighbor was using it or something like that, you may not be able to eat those foods. So notice that too. Nutrient, I want people to eat nutrient dense foods, organic, unsprayed. The more stress, the more protein. If you're going to eat beans, you can mix beans and grains together and increase the amount of protein that you're getting so that you're actually getting enough. But if you do that, you're going to be getting about a hundred for a half cup of cooked beans and a half cup of cooked grains, like rice, uh, rice is a little lower, but quinoa, for instance, you will get enough, you get plenty of, of protein to support your activity and your stress, but your carbohydrate load is going to be 100 grams of carbohydrate. And that's about as much as anybody whose blood sugars are around 100 is, should really have in order to protect your body, your brain. Uh, it's You know, you want to starve cancer cells. I mean, particularly if you have cancer, you want to starve them. So you want to eat more you don't want your blood sugars to get high you want to keep your carbs down do you want to blow it all in one meal you know and also it pertains your it pertains your brain from dementias and alzheimer's because the higher your blood sugars get the more um the more your your brain actually is unable to take up the sugar and your brain is the thing that really runs all the time we hope all the time it's running with your heart and that's the that's the organ that's demanding the sugar for you know it's at least what they say so um if your blood sugars get high your brain actually gets hypoglycemic it gets low in sugar and it's more likely to give you uh dementia we're just about to the end here again you need to k n o w yourself I don't want you to just know, you don't have to just make yourself do things that you don't want to do, but know yourself, understand yourself well enough to know what calls to you, what things can you do to be part of the solution, and what sorts of things are affecting you, and how does your food affect you, and how does this affect you. Pay attention, and don't forget about the natural environment, because that's part of you too. It's all... It's all, in, you know, I used to call myself a health integrationist, not because, um, well, it was for a variety of reasons. It was about the idea of things being a part of a whole. So we're at the end here. We're just about wrapping up here. And I, I just want to thank all of you who have been listening to me go on and remind you that you're listening. I'm Lena Berman, and you're listening to your own health and fitness. And you can go to our our website, which is yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature, a free stream of this week's show, and there's lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Again, if you want to reach us, it's admin, A-D-M-I-N, at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Now, we are going to play a piece of music for a musical break that I recommend people get if they like classical music and use when they need to calm down. It's an album that we heard a piece from on, on Philip's Sunday show. It's Jane Antonia Cornish's album. It's, she's a composer, and it's, her, it's an album of her music called Continuum. C-O-N-T-I-N-U-U-M. We're going to play it for break, and it's a wonderful, calming piece of music. Your Own Health and Fitness is produced by Lena Berman and Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. Remember, being informed not only protects your health, it protects your freedom. KPFA's annual Grateful Dead fundraising marathon is set for Saturday, February 24th, 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. Pacific time. It'll be streamed globally on kpfa.org, nugs.net, and gdradio.net. So tell your friends all over the globe to tune in and join the planetary dance. Mark, Karen, and friends will perform live, and we'll have plenty of great recorded music to share. I'm David Gans. Please join Tim Lynch and me for the annual KPFA Grateful Dead marathon, Saturday, February 24th, 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. Pacific time. I'm on KPFA. Attention KPFA listeners. 
I want to thank you for your passionate letters, emails, and calls in support of your radio station. We've been through rough waters before, and the only way to survive is to keep moving forward. We believe we have a strong bond with you, a firm relationship mounted on our mission, our promises made 69 years ago that continues to power us. I'm here to assure you that your independent radio station will keep up our end of the bargain, and we will continue to bring you the voices of the powerless and progressive. Any and all donations made to us will be used to keep the station operational and moving ahead in our goals. Nobody knows what the future will bring, but we have